Go back. Okay, go back. All right. Now, please. Okay. Hello and welcome to Celebrating Excellence. This year's Nobel Laureate Festival has as its theme, Celebrating Excellence, Facing New Realities, Creating New Modalities. The festival showcases lectures, exhibitions, award ceremonies, drama productions, and crayon and literary workshops. Our guest today is Jalim Yulevic, a global sculpture, goodwill ambassador, and Caribbean laureate. As a local sculptor from a family of artists, we asked him what he felt about Sir Derek Walcott's impact on the visual arts. Well, first of all, I must say that um, Derek Walcott is an absolute giant, right? And when you have such an epic figure um, infuse your genre of arts, which is visual arts, you know, um, that in itself um, has a domino effect on, on, on how you perceive everything in that, in that world. Because there is no Nobel Prize for visual arts. Um, but when you have somebody who has received the highest honor partaking in the same genre of creativity as you, you know, um, that is tremendous. You know, that just re um, revitalizes um, every cell in your being. And I could remember as a, as a young kid, um, Derek Walcott will, will, often, will very often visit um, my, my dad's studio. You know, and he was quite in love with my, my father's work, and he was um, he was a patron of my of my dad. You know, so that in itself had a very profound impact on me. Seeing Derek walking around art, and and also experiencing his particular artwork. I mean, he he was very um, you know um, you know profuse with um, with his watercolors. He, he was he was a consummate professional when it comes to the watercolor in particular, but you also dabble in acrylic and oils as well, you know? And what that did is that made me realize that, you know, this is, you know, like the, the uh, creativity is a universe. You know, expression, one form of, of expression to the other, um, is basically the same thing. You know, you, you know there's, there, there, there's nothing in that universe that is mutually exclusive. You know, everything is inclusive. Um, when I do my work now, you know, there's this very powerful conceptual side of my work as well. It's not just about imagery. It's not just about um, the materialization of, of, of an image or form. It's, there's a much deeper component. You know, I see the poetry, I see the, the more intangible aspects of it, you know. You know, I think there work sometimes when I when I create my um, you know work, you know. Um, Derek sought to to make regal the the mundane. You know, he once said in an interview that there's a penance that comes with um, um, living in the Caribbean or being a Caribbean person, and that penance is that everything is deemed inferior. Um, that of the outside world, you know, especially that of the colonial powers. If you're going to take it in the context to of you know, colonialism, and um, so he said that for for example, the uh, mango tree was never as great as the oak tree, right? So what he did as a writer, as a poet, is he sought to give the mango tree that regality you know, that the oak tree had, simply because Shakespeare spoke about the oak tree and all those great writers from the from, from um, Europe spoke about the oak tree. They endowed it with that kind of regality, that kind of importance and prominence. So when I do my, my um, artwork, you know, today, you know, I have that same kind of philosophy where I want to make regal, you know, what is, um, you know, perceived ordinary. You know, so I, I call it a, a, a design philosophy. You know, you know that's that's my philosophy and that, something that I got from Derek Walker. Also, my 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 dad as well. But you know, um, but Derek put it said it very profoundly. You know, so his words had a very deep deep impact on me. And um, this is my prized possession. This is the Derek Walker. This is this is where he stored quite a few of his uh, mineral brushes and I, I was 
gifted this rush chest I call it you know when I'm there work on dying I was gifted um, one of his um, his brush cabinets by his his spouse Sigrid Nama Walcott you know and, um, and it's, it's, it's one of my my prized possessions and it still has um, a lot of his brushes and his his um, his, his instruments in it Derek Derek Walcott for me is the is is the, uh, the catalyst that 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 you know, made me realize that you know what you know that that this thing is huge it is epic right that you could really do this on a real on a global scale you know because if a solution from this 244 square mile area can you know um, um, um reach that level of excellence in his art form then so can i you know then so can i to receive a program of events visit the Facebook page at Nobel Laureate Festival St. Lucia or call 758-717-7979. The festival runs until the 31st of January 2022. Goodbye.
and welcome to Celebrating Excellence. For the last 29 years, St. Lucia has been celebrating its two Nobel laureates, Sir William Arthur Lewis and Sir Derek Alton Walcott. Every year, the festival has a sub-theme, and this year it's facing new realities, creating new modalities. Natalie Laporte is an actress and poet who performed in many of Sir Derek Walcott's plays. She tells us of her memories of Sir Derek and a special phrase he coined. One of the things I really loved about Derek was he had such an insight and a sort of sage awareness about St. Lucia, his native land and the people who live in it. And I remember he said once, it matters where you come from. And I remember being struck by that because it was so simple yet so profound, it matters where you come from. Because I think normally we are encouraged, maybe even programmed to a certain degree, to look beyond toward the future, what's in front, what lies ahead, what school are you going to, what job are you going to get, who will you marry, how many kids will you have. But not so trendy is looking back and sort of taking the roots of your past, your ancestry, your ethnicity, and bringing that forward into your present and then into your future. And I feel that maybe that quote had something to do with that. Derek was very, very fascinated by our creative process. You know, the drums, the violin, you know, he, he thrived in it. It, almost, it was almost his heartbeat. It has a sort of longing in it. It matters where you come from. See, see yourself. Let's see ourselves as the island nation that we are, as the regional people that we are, what we represent. And there's a sort of, I don't know, philosophical spin I like to put on it, like, what do we represent as a people? What do we represent as people, as humans, individuals, and by extension, everyone everywhere we go everyone we meet what who we talk to what we say uh what do we want to represent you know i think these are things that derek took very very seriously he carried them in his heart always he spoke of them and it manifested in his work you know beautifully and i think also of the sort of intrinsic almost endemic beauty of being saint lucian of being caribbean it's in the way we walk, it's in what we cook, it's in the way we welcome strangers into our homes, it's the speed with which we help people who need a helping hand. Those are things that you find more easily in the Caribbean than you would find in other places, what we like to call the bigger countries, you know, because they live by different systems. And I think also what that phrase might represent, that quote might represent is, there's an intangible beauty about being Caribbean. In my work with him, I would see that happen often because he might have something scripted a certain way, and then all of a sudden he'll have a feeling, and it would be, no, scratch that. <laughs> let's do it this way instead and you just have to kind of roll and he was very expectant of you as an, an artist to be able to move maybe like the ocean ebb and flow easily with that sort of process um, it was in everything he did it was in everything he said and i think one of the most beautiful things even though it may not be that obvious was that even as he passed he left that with us was that we can be even greater than we already are you know he used to sit in his patio and look out at the ocean always he always needed to be sitting facing the ocean and i think it was not just to see the ocean to hear the waves breaking on the shore but to feel the ocean he didn't want to be locked up inside he never liked that he liked outdoors he liked nature and even when he would speak, he wasn't always very talkative, but when he did speak, that came through in his language. So uh, the, 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 the honesty of that quote, the, the simplicity of it, to me just redirects to us as a people, individuals, how we continue to treat ourselves, and then how we treat each other especially in the decades to come you know i think derek was trying to create a, a long-term vision 
for us so that we can continue to build on that intrinsic beauty and be the greatest that we can be. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful sentiment. The Sir Derek Walcott Memorial Lecture, The Demand of Beauty, will be delivered by St. Lucian poet Mr. Kendall Hippolyte and takes place on Tuesday the 18th of January at 7.30pm at the Finance Administrative Centre. The Nobel Laureate Festival Committee thanks the Library Cooperative Credit Union for its sponsorship of the Sir Derek Walcott Memorial Lecture. There is limited in-person attendance with COVID-19 protocols in place, but the lecture will also be recorded by the National Television Network. Visit the Facebook page at Nobel Laureate Festival St. Lucia for more information. The festival runs until the 31st of January 2022. I hope to see you commenting online. I'm Dina Delore. Goodbye. Ladies and gentlemen, the Nobel Laureate Festival Committee and the Cultural Development Foundation welcomes you to the 2022 Sir Derek Walcott Memorial Lecture. Please stand for the National Anthem of St. Lucia. join me in welcoming tonight's master of ceremony, Mr. Phil Henderson. And you may have your seat. Good night. Establishing protocol for the evening. Her Excellency Exemplar Dame Paulette Louisi, Chairperson for the Nobel Laureate Committee. The Honorable Philip J. Pierre, Prime Minister, Minister for Finance, Economic Development and Youth Economy. The Honorable Dr. Ernest Hiller, Minister for Tourism, Investment, Creative Industries, Culture and Information. His Excellency Peter Chen, Ambassador, Embassy for the Republic of China, Taiwan. Mr. Claudius Francis, Speaker of the House of Assembly. Dr. Cadela Lane Ambrose, Permanent Secretary in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for housing and local government. Ms. Solage Belize, Deputy Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Tourism, Investment, Creative Industries, Culture and Information. Her Worship, Geraldine Lendor, Gabriel, Mayor of Castries. Ms. Mondi Lewis, Press Secretary to the Prime Minister. Ms. Ramo Mrs. Ramona Henry Wine, Executive Director of the Cultural Development Foundation. Mr. Lyndon Arnold, Deputy Managing Director for the Bank of St. Lucia. Sigrid Nama, and the family of Sir Derek Walcott. I would like to welcome everyone to the 2022 Sir Derek Walcott Memorial Lecture. Welcome everybody. I would like to thank everyone for being here this evening. We understand that the protocols are quite difficult to adhere to at all corners of this life. However, you have made a very special attempt to recognize the late, the great Sir Derek Walcott. And for that, you should give yourself a round of applause. Sir Derek Walcott has written about every square inch of St. Lucia, from Mon Fortune to Mola Sheik, 
and the surrounding islands from Santa Cruz in Trinidad to St. Croix. And he's been able to describe in such articulate detail in a way that we have not seen since his mastery of the language has gone in a way that no St. Lucian and possibly no one else in the world so far has been able to compete with. For this reason, the Cultural Development Foundation and the Nobel Laureate Association has decided to honor him this evening with this lecture and these presentations by the artists that you have seen earlier. I would now call your attention to the screens as we have a audio video presentation by Mr. Kendall Hippolyt, who would later be giving uh, tonight's lecture. Uh, take, take your attention to the screens, please. Born in St. Lucia in 1952, retired lecturer in literature and drama, Kendall Hippolyte, studied and lived in Jamaica in the 1970s, where he explored his talents as a poet, playwright, and a director. His writing explores the spectrum of standard and Caribbean English, working with traditional forms, free verse, and forms influenced by popular culture, as well as poems written in Quayle, his native language. He has published seven books of poetry, the latest being Word Planting, Peepal Tree Press, 2019. And his poems have appeared internationally in various journals such as the Greenfield Review, the Massachusetts Review, and in anthologies like Caribbean Poetry Now, Voice Print, West Indian Poetry, and others. In 2007, he won the Bridget Jones Travel Award and traveled to England to present his one-man dramatized poetry production, Kinky Blues, at the annual conference of the Society for Caribbean Studies. He has twice won the Literature Prize in the Minville and Chastney Fine Arts Awards, which was for years the premier arts award scheme in St. Lucia, and is the winner of the 2013 Bocas Festival Poetry Prize. He has performed his work in the Caribbean, Europe and America at literary festivals and events. Mr. Hippolyte has also established himself as an innovative playwright and director, authoring eight plays and directing scores of others, including his own, The Drum Maker, 1976, The Song of One, 1995, and Triptych, 2000, all of which have been published in drama anthologies. In 1984, he co-founded the Lighthouse Theatre Company in St. Lucia and has long been involved in all aspects of the dramatic arts on the island. He has toured with theatre productions in the Caribbean and the UK. At different times, he has been involved as actor, director and administrator in St. Lucia's contingents travelling to Carafesta. Mr. Hippolyte is an original and continuing member of the Syllabus Panel for the Caribbean Examinations Council CXE Theatre Arts Programme and serves as an external examiner. In 2000, he was awarded the St. Lucia Medal of Merit Gold for his contribution to the arts. Recently retired from the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, his present focus is to use his skills as a writer and a dramatist to raise public awareness and contribute to active solutions of critical social issues. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to continue to put your hands together for our esteemed lecturer this evening, Mr. Kendall Hippolyte. I want to thank the organizers for this very generous introduction. Um, and um, protocol haven't been established, and given that we're in the season of curfews and therefore time is pressing on us, 
my greetings will be very, very short, but I'm very, very pleased to be here tonight. I'm very, very pleased that the, the range of persons who, who are here tonight and the, and the feeling of support and presence that, that, I, that I get from you. And, and though we can't see them, I'm very, very grateful too for those in cyberspace whose presence I'm sure is um, also supportive. <clears throat> okay. The demand of beauty. It's something I absolutely believe. A Derek Walcott poem saved my life. There's not a metaphor. It's not a whimsical, poetic way of, of expressing some psychological or spiritual truth. The statement is literal. A Derek Walcott poem saved my life. March 23rd, 1972, Thursday late afternoon, I'm sitting in the students' lounge of what was then called the Teacher's Training College at Mon Fortune. The room is on the lower floor of a two-story building, one of a cluster of late 19th century, early 20th century colonial barracks, progressively converted into educational buildings. The room is large, and directly below a larger room upstairs, the assembly hall. Why am I there on a Thursday afternoon with a backpack that holds a notebook and a pen, copy of Derek Walcott's in a green night, most likely another book or two, quite likely a fruit and you know, some biscuits and juice. And I was 20 years old. A habit had developed in me from years before of walking up to the morn with a backpack of food for body and soul, um, snacks, juice, books, pen, notebook, and finding a quiet spot in one of the buildings where I could reflect and read and write. I had gone to the morn that Thursday in March, 1972, not knowing that an event was taking place at the Teachers Training College, a morn complex um, beauty pageant and, and concert. Beautiful afternoon, it's clear sky and easy light and gentle temperature. You know. The sounds of the event upstairs were not intrusive in that high ceiling room below, with jalousied French windows opening onto the arches of the surrounding veranda, glimpses of trees, plants just outside, a green hill range in the southern distance. I have no memory of why it was Walcott's in a green night that I was reading then, but I remember, I will always remember, the poem, Bleecker Street, Summer. I had sat in a locally crafted wrought iron two-seater chair with flowered cushions and begun reading the opening lines. Summer for prose and lemons, for nakedness and languor, for the eternal idleness of the imagined return. Something about these lines, uh, you know, a sense of airiness and wide delight, and made me feel dissatisfied with sitting inside a room to read them. So I got up and I went out past the, the, the arches and onto the staircase of the veranda. I stood on the top step and I faced west where the sun was taking its light and I began reading again. Then I heard a sound, loud, harsh, to my right. That's, that's all I would have been able to say in that instant. But seconds later, I knew what that sound was. It was the first cracking and splintering as the ceiling of the room upstairs the room downstairs, sorry, and the floor of the room upstairs began to split and, and break open. I have only the slimmest memory of the sounds of voices, although there must have been screams, wailing, and shockingly loud shouts, but in memory, the sounds are dim. It's just a background murmur to the sight of bodies falling, moving blurs of variously colored dresses, trousers, shirts, flailing through the brief distance downward to the room below where I had been. And my next memory is being inside the room with a couple of other men trying to help persons out towards the veranda. Some in a state of shock only needed guiding. Others needed actual physical support. Who the two men were, I don't know. They might have been in the audience upstairs or like me, persons who happened to have been in or near the building at the time. But there's one striking memory which will always stay with me. One of these men and myself were helping Mrs. Marjorie Thomas, one of the lecturers at the training college, out of the room. Each of us was holding an arm, he her right, I her left, and walking with small steps. She was staring straight ahead, and yet not, because the stare had no focus. 
I was edging around an obstacle on my left with a slow, careful shuffle for Mrs. Thomas. And then my peripheral vision caught and held something, has held it to this day. It was the two-seater couch that I had been sitting in. Its cushions still haphazardly on it, but its shape buckled and twisted in a silent metallic tension. The image registered, just a soundless absence, soundless snapshot, and I continued helping Mrs. Thomas toward one of the open French windows. I've pondered many times since then what drew me out of that room to read a Derek Walcott poem in the open sunlight and air and greenery. What? Something demanded it. It was a gentle demand, not a peremptory order, but not a vague inner suggestion either. The demand promised joy, but it also had authority, and I obeyed. And over the years, I began to slowly understand that this demand also came with a responsibility folded inside the joy that it promised. It was the demand of beauty. Beauty is experienced through all our senses. But tonight, I want to focus on the beauty which comes in through the sense of sight. And even more specifically, the beauty that comes when our sight experiences landscape. I believe beauty is an invitation. Every time we see something as beautiful, it's an invitation. To what, though? The individual words and phrases we can use, harmony, sense of things coming together, what someone called the fitness of things, it's a phrase I like. The clusters of words that we could use to try to convey this experience. But honestly, if I had my way, I wouldn't speak now. Instead, I, I would have several jigsaw puzzles. I would break us all in, into small groups. Each group would have the task of, of putting its jigsaw together. That would be the first marvel. Then, when each group had finished its jigsaw, all the groups would come together, and then they, in turn, would have to create the larger image, which emerges from bringing all the individual images together. After that, no lecture would be needed about the experience of beauty. We would know, absolutely, that it involves a coming together of various elements. We would also know that we are necessary for this coming together. We would have come together. And that would be an inextricable part of the beauty. But we're not doing jigsaws, we're juggling words, doing the best we can of those. I said a little earlier that the experience of beauty is an invitation to, well, for now, let's call it harmony. And in the jigsaw scenario just now, the, the harmony wasn't only the external one of all the elements of a beautiful image coming together. People had to interact with those elements, and most crucially, with each other, for this harmony to come into being. The harmony is internal as well as external, simultaneously. Beauty is an invitation to that harmony, external and internal, all at once. And if we accept that invitation, there is a demand, and it's of this I wish to speak. St. Lucia is staggeringly beautiful. Its painters and photographers have for generations tried to hold that beauty still in the frame of a painting or a photograph and tried to tell us, look, 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 look at that again. Literally thousands of paintings and photographs, and its poets, struggling as best they can with words, have walked alongside the visual artists, and they have told us to listen. And in listening, see. Let's pause and listen to the poets. Here's Derek Walcott, speaking of the vocation that he and his friend Dunstan St. Thomas discovered to praise the beauty of the island. But drunkenly or secretly, we swore, disciples of that astigmatic saint, that we would never leave the island until we had put down in paint, in words, as palmists learn the network of a hand, all of its sunken, leaf-choked ravines, every neglected, self-pitying inlet muttering in brackish dialect, the ropes of mangroves from which old soldier crabs slipped, surrendering to slush, each ochre track seeking some hilltop and losing itself in an unfinished phrase, on the sand shipyards where the burnt out palms inverted the design of unrigged schooners, 
entering forests, boiling with life. Guiav, Consol, Poacanot, Chapouti. The beauty of St. Lucia kept Walcott connected here. No matter how much like a kite he soared and swooped and dipped all over the world, he was always pulled back in. His earliest poetry as a teenager praised its landscape. And in his penultimate work, he was still praising it. This is from seven years before he died. All day I wish I was at Kazamba, passing incongruous cactus which grows in the north, in the chasm deep ruts of the dry season, with the thunderous white horses that dissolve in froth, and the bush that mimics them with white cotton, to the strengthening smell of kale from the bright Atlantic as the road ruts level and you come upon a view that dissolves into pure description. There's a painful irony in that second line about the cactus in the north, now that it has been destroyed. And I'm glad he wasn't there to see that destruction, but we'll come back to that. Of course, Derek Walcott wasn't the only poet to move to ecstatic utterance, only the most famous. Here's MacDonald Dixon. One generation later, another poet with a painter's eye. What follows is not, is not a sequence from one specific poem. I'm, I'm pulling extracts from various poems. The fascination with landscape is palpable. I am intrigued by landscape. How they burn, ochres, yellows, and vermilion, violets creeping in lonely country cemeteries. The breeze dancing la comète with leaves on dusty country roads. Under a parasol of breadfruit leaves, a town plays leapfrog with the sun. I think Walcott stimulated a taste for bold flourishes of language in, in describing landscape, which some of the poets of a later generation gladly explored without trying in any way to sound like him. Here's John Robert Lee, a poet whose work organically expresses his deep Christian faith looking at the landscape. In cathedrals of palmists, chapels of flamboyant, shrines of banana fronds, grottos of cocoa, groves of ripening mango, sanctuaries of anthurium, holy places of fern. Praise the Lord. Like some of the other poets I'll, I'll be quoting from, his, his descriptions sometimes are very geographically grounded in very, very specific St. Lucian locations. Above Soufrière, descending early, morning heals the night in sulfur baths, covers over all in fine rain and light. The influence of that language of large, generous gesture continues, again without any slavish imitation, in the work of a more recent voice. Um, here's George Goddard, my contemporary, in fact a schoolmate, doing musical riffs in, in his rendition of landscape. The sea has pounded this coast since God alone can remember. It has taught the startled songs that the Ciso learns high in the ripping Atlantic wind. And at the Lambouchoui, it has summoned all winged things to ready the violins, sea crabs to string the quattro, balloon fish will blow the baha. A celebration begins. In another poem, the poem, the, the beauty is expressed in both Creole and English. Give me rivers, clear runnels, whose waters come from the hills and the high peaking mountains, and at the riverside, wild pigeons stopping to drink water from the clouds and the high places. A poet colleague, um, Kwame Dawes, speaking about the flourish in, in our poetic language, he told me once, boy, all these St. Lucians are rosematic, indicating that the language was presenting things for, you know, for rose-colored glasses. It was a gentle dig. It wasn't an accusation of insincerity. But there's a solid core of truth in it. And I think that the influence of a spectacularly beautiful landscape has to be partly responsible. There's a poet called Kendall Hippolyt, who seems to have been looking far more at socioscape than landscape. And even when looking at landscape, he tends to focus more on what has been done to it than what it was in its original form. But even this poet relaxes his political gaze long enough to see 
hillside grass running lightly before a silver wind, or a far slope rippling like a muscled shoulder. Hosanna is the scattering of pigeons. Hallelujah stands the tree in the noon hour. Selah, the samadhi of waves in the late afternoon. Another poet, Jane King, generally holds a more in interior gaze, looking into the minds of individuals and groups and into the collective unconscious. But she too is entranced enough by the island's topography to verbally articulate it. The perfect turquoise of the bay, a green arc of the harbor with a frilled cuff where the surf breaks on tapir rock, the soothing breeze that shakes the trees blowing gently around my knees, grapefruit shine yellow in dark leaves, it is enough. Like Robert Lee and MacDonald Dixon, her focus can be geographically quite specific. I cannot find this island loveliest in drought. I love it best all silver green with rain when clouds creep off La Saucière and down the morn. That same geographical specificity sometimes occurs in the poetry of Adrian Auger, as in the poem Comrette, in the name of the bay where the poem is set a green saddle between hills, harbored by seas, counseled by wind, clocked by a sun burning slowly through muslin layers of drifting sky. Hair waves beat their rhythm against a wilderness of salt air, sea grapes and accumulating sand evolving into green savannas. The final poet I'll refer to takes us beyond looking at the landscape into actively being within it. Ras Eisley's poem, Just Wandering, which he performs beautifully, takes us on a, on a hike deep in the country, where we climb hills, bathe under waterfall, pick and roast bread fruit, and see all manner of wildlife from ants to parrots. Let's go with him. Now we go in through the veins of the country, talking about the rivers that run to the sea. Water Cool, fresh, airy, big rocks. Wha? Watch Zodom, Pibish, Zonji. Long time now, them things me not see. Don't kill them, no? Watch a big lizard on a, on a lasso tree. An iguana, no? Shh. Hey, a jacko. Watch it just glide over there. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Why do you just wandering deep in other country. It's incredible, the, the, the light and joy and love and veneration that, that these poets convey. And yet I don't, I don't want you to, to come away from this word journey thinking of the poets. What they're feeling and expressing is not particular to them. It's not because they're poets that they feel all this. What they're experiencing is what all of us have experienced. Some days more, some days less intensely. But these experiences are common to all of us who live here. That's why we recognize them so immediately. Poets have the, the gift of finding and weaving together the words which describe it. But the experience they describe is ours. Spontaneously, intrinsically ours. Each one of us. What is that experience though? Of what does it consist? I want you to join me in trying to understand it. I will try to understand it, as poets sometimes do, by making an image. Imagine all these lines we've just heard, plaited together, making a rope. We begin with the first three lines of the first Walcott poem. We plait them, we keep going, and as we come to the end, add another three lines. We plait those, eventually moving on to the next poet, and then the next poet making the rope. This rope, like any rope, is made of strands. What are these strands? One obvious one is the, the, the natural delight, the, the instinctive joy that spontaneously happens when one sees a beautiful landscape. But why is there joy? We take it for granted, but really, why is there joy? And what does this joy do in us? to us. To try to answer this, I have to begin with an obvious truth. Born into time and space, all our experiences have to happen always somewhere. 
a place. Among the experiences which happen to us from childhood onwards is the experience of beauty of landscape. The adult says to the child, wow, look at these flowers. Gosh, look at that sunset. Mm, these waves look nice. The child grows, whether in the country of birth or another place, and continues having these early experiences of the beauty of landscape. And these begin to create a connection, a, a bond, really, between human being and physical environment, between the person and the green hill, the person and the waves lapping at the shore, the person and the glory cedar trees flanking the roadside walked every day. They become part of the being of you, the growing child, teenager, adult. At some point in the growing, you get an ID card, perhaps a passport also. It says you're a citizen of such and such a country. Yeah, you can claim that country officially of this document. And it's a claim that's absolutely necessary in, in certain contexts. But the deeper claim happens before and beyond ID card and passport. One crucial way it happens, I believe, is through accumulated moments of beauty. Like, when you, when you begin the descent into Soufriere, from the, the crest of the junction, which has the road to Bouton in your right, and as you descend, a first glimpse of the pitons appears through the foliage. It is at such moments that you claim the island. And yet deeper than that, it claims you. What you feel then has nothing to do with ownership in any official sense. The landscape of the island, through its beauty, possesses you. That feeling one, is one strand of the, the rope represented by the, the lines of the poets. That feeling. Another strand in the rope is an expressive celebration. Where it's possible to feel beauty and not express it. But in the experience that we're exploring here, there is expression. In Derek Walcott's Another Life, he gives us a, a narrative image of two young men trying to render one, one in visual line and mass and color and the other one in words, trying to render the beauty of the St. Lucian landscape, celebrating it. Why? Why were they doing this? A celebration was spontaneous, yes, but it wasn't simplistically innocent. It wasn't naive. Not just the, the, the purely delighted expression of a child saying, wow, you know, at, at a picturesque sight. Their celebration of landscape in paint, in words, was deliberately saying, yes, this is worthy of the highest praise, as good as anything else the world out there holds up as praiseworthy. The world out there in their time was very overtly colonial and imperial. And seen through its eyes, breadfruit trees and mango trees were picturesque, but not as worthy as oak trees and apple trees. So the celebration of landscape visually and, and verbally by Dunstan and Derrick was not simple, innocent delight. It was anti-colonial and anti-imperial. Two generations later, it's easy to underestimate this. In fact, to not even see it. But we have to, because they, and others like them began a work that we must continue now, perhaps even bring to a conclusion. Our express celebration of the beauty of our landscape, which is the second strand in the rope, has to be every bit as ideological as theirs was. In fact, more so. The landscape in their time was not threatened with obliteration by climate change and by so-called development, as our landscape now is. Before we come to the third strand, I'll, I'll make a small detour here to, to point out that this, this praise of landscape in words is not confined to poets. I mean, I've been looking at the anthems and national songs of a number of Caribbean countries, beginning of ours. Many of them reference the beauty of landscape. Sons and daughters of St. Lucia, love the land that gave you birth. Land of beaches, hills and valleys, fairest isle of all the earth. We'll come back to St. Lucia, but let's look at some of the other countries. The anthem of St. Vincent and the Grenadines has these lines. Hyrule, our fair and blessed isle, your mountains high, so clear and green, are home to me, though I may stray, a haven, calm, serene. It goes on. But, uh, 
the, the landscape reference in the Barbados anthem is brief, but it overtly spells out a sentiment which is more subliminal in some of the other anthems, a kind of take charge, independent spirit. These fields and hills beyond recall are now our very own. The subtext of these lines is saying, this is ours now, back off. We recently saw an even more overt expression of that spirit on November 30th last year in the transition towards republic status. The anthem of the Turks and Caicos Islands has these lines, from the east, west, north, and south, our banks and oceans meet, surrounding sands and hills of glee, our pristine beauty sea, so on and so on. Um, the anthem of the British Virgin Islands is um, God Save the Queen. Um, it's moving right along. There are others, but I, I won't be quoting those. Um, there are some countries don't reference the landscape. Um, Jamaica, Trinidad, Grenada, St. Kitts. And I think for, for praise of landscape, Dominica takes the prize. The anthem even has a title, Isle of Beauty. Isle of Beauty, Isle of Splendor, Isle to all so sweet and fair. All must surely gaze in wonder at thy gifts so rich and rare. Rivers, valleys, hills and mountains, all these gifts we do extol. Healthy lands, so like all fountains, giving cheer that warms the soul. So on and so on and so on. Dominica has been known as the Nature Isle for as long as I can remember. So it's no surprise to find that the anthem is so full of reference to nature in general. But why have I taken us on this tour of Caribbean anthems and patriotic songs? To underscore what, of course, we already know. National identity. And that's a huge term. National identity is nurtured by an expressive and a celebratory love of the landscape of the nation. And there's no need to go into the significance of the Pitons, that, that, you know, that the significance they've held for generations who've lived and, and, and who live here beginning of the Kalinago and the Arawak people, continuing down to the child who yesterday or, or this morning just sketched two adjacent triangles, perhaps if a little circle in between them, said, boom, the pitons. That child, like others generations before, is saying, look, look at this. And continuing a tradition where the beauty of the landscape is experienced, praised, celebrated. The first two words in the motto of St. Lucia are the land. That's not accidental. And that brings me to an aspect of all these anthems and patriotic songs. Sometimes it's overtly expressed, sometimes implied. I noted that in the Barbados anthem it's very plainly stated. These fields and hills beyond recall are now our very own. That second line, are now our very own expresses an attitude. There's this pride and a fierce protectiveness. To whom are these words sung? The two audiences. One audience is the people of the country, or at any rate, the overwhelming majority of them, who are being called on to claim the country, to nurture a sense of belonging to it. The other audience is almost a ghost, the ghost of the former imperial master, who had once claimed the landscape and people as belonging to it. And I say almost a ghost because the possibility of that external claim does not miraculously vanish at political independence. There are different ways in which an external power can claim and possess the landscape and people of a country. And the external power is not necessarily another nation. But in those lines, that second audience, that external power is being told, being warned, you might say, that these fields and hills are now our very own. Back off. And this fierce protectiveness, so plainly declared in the Barbados anthem, is present to one degree or another in all the anthems of the Anglophone Caribbean. This feeling of protectiveness is the third strand in the rope that we've been plaiting with the words of the poets. And that feeling is an intrinsic part of the demand of beauty. One crucial way in which it expresses itself is the instinct to preserve the beauty. Now here, uh, here's where a classic problem of development surfaces. Can you preserve and still progress? Obviously, before we can begin to answer, both terms need exploring. 
Um, what exactly are you trying to preserve? Uh, what exactly are you trying to progress towards? Questions are simply stated, but the answers, nations have gone to war over them. But do I believe it's possible for preservation and progress to hold hands? Yes. Do I believe there are answers that meet the needs of both? Yes. And the answers, I believe, are not, are not in specific external forms, but in specific principles. The preservation of beauty is not invariably the preservation of specific shapes of beauty. Yes, that's dangerous ground um, to be trod very carefully. Also, the journey towards progress is not invariably towards a specific shape of progress. More dangerous ground. Also to be trod very carefully. Only examining the principles underneath all this can guide us. So let's begin to examine them. Human beings alter the natural landscapes they live in. That's, that's inevitable. We always have, we always will. Depending on the principles at work and the type of alteration, the altered landscape may in time become as natural as what was there before. St. Lucia did not always have breadfruit trees and mango trees and, and, and pigeon peas. It would take an ethnobotanist to explain to us how many species of trees and vegetation, which we now take as part of the landscape, were introduced from elsewhere. Why and how they were introduced, how they affected the ecology existing at the time and over time, who and what benefited from their introduction, who and what were disadvantaged by it, both then and now. All of these are finally considerations in fully understanding a portion of landscape that has in it a couple of breadfruit trees, a few mango trees, and some bushes of pigeon peas. So yes, we, we must alter the landscape, and so the issue of preservation and progress must arise. But the alteration can be a dance of two partners, or it can be a wrestling match. In both cases, there are principles, but if it's to be a dance, the principles obviously are different from those of a wrestling match, where there has to be a winner and a loser. As a starting point in all of this, let's, let's first take note that an intentional, significant alteration of landscape is always part of a wider change that, that almost invariably involves an alteration in the socioscape. Sometimes the alteration is huge, like the change in the middle of the 17th century in the Caribbean from small and medium-sized tracts of Amerindian tribal lands, variegated variegation and, and appearance, to uniform fields of hundreds of hectares of sugarcane. This change of landscape reflected a change of political structure, from the relatively democratic governments of a homogeneous tribe to the tyranny of a slave society, from collective ownership of the land to minority ownership of a large proportion of the land by a small racial group, and the land being worked by a landless majority of a different racial group. And the shape of that intertwining of landscape and socioscape continued beyond emancipation into the middle of the 20th century, with only minor incremental changes. It's in the second half of the 20th century that this begins to change. In St. Lucia, it was the switch to bananas which had begun in the 1950s and gained serious traction in the 1960s, which altered both the landscape and the socioscape. It created a prosperous rural middle class, whose children swelled the ranks of the urban middle class, who further altered the landscape through the kinds of residences that they built and, and the kinds of buildings that were required for the type of um, workspaces that they occupied and so on. Landscape, socioscape, always an interaction. In a traditional rural setting, human dwelling and natural landscape are more likely to be good dancing partners. Houses are more likely to be in spaces which have trees and plants of different kinds. Some of them will have been there for before the houses. There may be a backyard garden cultivating plants for food and medicine. In the not so distant past of St. Lucia, just two generations ago, even when people move from country to town, they try to carry that ethos with them. I can remember a pawpaw tree and a lime tree and some of the plants in our yard when I was a child. There was a small mound of river stones for, for bleaching clothes on. My eldest brother remembers my father growing potatoes and yam and peanuts and tomatoes. And, you know. But of course, sustaining that kind of ethos presupposes space. 
And space is what becomes increasingly scarce in a setting that is becoming typically urbanized. The population expands, the space shrinks. Landscape, socioscape, changing together. Still dancing, but the dance is becoming uneasy, it's showing signs of morphing from dancing into wrestling. As the country becomes more urbanized, or to be more accurate, more urbanized within the stereotypical Western framework, the connection with nature, and therefore the relationship to landscape, becomes more tenuous. The green starts to disappear. The river becomes clogged and black. The botanical gardens begins to, to mutate into a bus terminal. And yet the need for a felt connection is strong. It's innate. Traditions like gatherings of family and friends at the beach, river limes, hikes, long walks persist. Even as the spaces for doing those become more constrained. Individuals seek and find other spots from which to watch a sunrise or a sunset when the three-story concrete building rises and blocks the view which had been there for decades. Experiencing the beauty of landscape, interacting with nature, are psychological needs. I would say they are organic needs, needs that our very bodies require if we are to be full human beings. So, since as human beings, we always alter the landscape. What's the first principle I would propose in any alteration of it? That the beauty inherent in the original shape of it be maintained as much as possible. Here's a case in point. Serenity Park in Sossusi Castries. I have a great appreciation for that park. It, 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 it really does make a, a beautiful difference in the vibe of the city. It serves not, not just the immediate geographical community, it serves the wider area of Castries. I mean, a range of people use this park for a range of reasons, you know, including free Wi-Fi and you know, managing love affairs and so on. Um, but I remember w when the park was being created, there had been a magnificent pui tree close to the roadside, which every year, sometime roughly within March to May, put on magnificently bright yellow garments of flowers and then gradually shed those flowers in a wide halo on the ground around it. I know I'm not, I'm not the only one who look forward to seeing this every year. The tree was cut down. I'm still trying at a loss to understand why. The design of the park, even with what I see as an excess of concrete, could easily have accommodated its presence, which would have been on the outside of the perimeter anyway. Incidentally, that tree has begun to reclaim its space, eh, for which I'm very glad. But this first principle of seeking to preserve, if at all possible, the original beauty of the landscape was not observed. Past was not even acknowledged. You see the same insensitivity when, when land is being cleared for the construction of houses. There's very little or no attempt to work with and within the existing landscape. And granted, it may not always be possible to, but is this first principle even recognized, acknowledged, given due consideration before construction begins. We'll come to deeper reasons why this first principle is so important. But let's look at the second principle. When preservation meets pro so second principle, when preservation meets progress. If, after due consideration, is determined that all right, there must be changes in the original landscape in order for progress to take place, then what considerations should guide those changes? If human-made structures uh, and, and or new vegetation have to be brought into the space, these should be ecologically harmonious, working with the manifestations of nature already existing in that space. I, mean, I wonder sometimes watching houses under construction, whether the owners of, of, of the, or, or the builders first check the usual direction of wind in the area. It could reduce future discomfort. It might even reduce air conditioned bills. Or if the vetiver is being replaced because more colorful plants are desired, will the more colorful plants do as effectively the work that the vetiver did of holding the soil together after heavy rain? So the second principle is to work with ecological harmony if you have to alter the original landscape. The word harmony leads us into the deeper reasons why these principles are important. I said earlier that the experience of beauty is an invitation to harmony. Of what? 
what is harmony? A basic way to think of it is as a, a balancing of diverse elements, a relationship among different things and forces, which allows them to not simply coexist, but coexist in ways that bring out the, the distinctive good qualities in each of them. And at the same time, the experience of all these individual qualities happening together is greater than the sum of all these qualities. It's an experience, I think, of, of another level of being alive, another order of being. Okay, I can, feel, I can feel already that these words are not conveying the intensity of meaning intended here. At this point in the lecture, what, what, what really should happen is that we, we sing a sesen song in four-part harmony. And then there'd be no need to explicate anything after that. And that's why I far prefer workshops to lectures. But, um, but we're stuck in this lecture format, and it has its uses, so let's continue. Harmony is, is a, a balancing of diverse elements. It's the opposite of uniformity. Uniformity is a large sugar cane plantation. Harmony is a backyard garden. And harmony, I believe, has an intrinsic, inherent morality at its core. A morality that's higher than the codes of social morality, which vary from society to society, and from era to era within a society. The beauty of landscape is not only an aesthetic experience, it's a moral experience. It's not accidental that the spiritual traditions of all cultures in the world have always made a connection between the beauty of the earth, indeed of the whole cosmos, and the higher being. You know, I, I'm hearing my mother's voice now from my childhood, intoning from the book of Psalms. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter of speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. It's from Psalm 19. Um, in Psalm 104, there's the same grandeur. Who covereth thyself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. I reach for examples from the Judeo-Christian spiritual literature because this is most prevalent in our society. But in the Quran, we find he is the one who created the seven heavens, one above the other. You will never see any imperfection in the creation of the most compassionate. Surah Al-Mulk, verses 3 to 4. And indeed, indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the alternation of the night and day, are signs for those of understanding. Surah Al-Imran, verse 190. And in the Vedas, the, the ancient sacred text of the Hindus, we find, you in your sturdy strength hold fast the forests, clamping the trees all firmly to the ground when rains and lightning issue your clouds. The Atava Veda, chapter 7, verses 2 to 4. And earth, the gracious leader and protector of the world, who holds in firm grasp both trees and plants, the maker of the world sought her with oblations when she was shrouded in the depth of the ocean. A vessel of gladness, long, long cherished in secret, the earth was revealed to mankind for their joy. From the Atha Veda, chapter 37. And these are examples from written texts of only three of the world religions. Examples from other written texts and, and from the oral texts of other major religions would reveal the same connection um, between the glory of, of nature and a higher order of being. Now, if experiencing the beauty of landscape has the potential to connect a person to a higher order of being, then what happens to a people when something called development begins to alienate them from the beauty of landscape. If development doesn't take into account, it deliberately make room for the experience of a higher order of being, harmony. In what sense is it development? Because finally, what are you developing? The cliche language of politics says, a nation? Yeah, but what is a nation? Hopefully we know, despite all the tourism public relations, that is more than a destination. That's a question that cannot begin outside of us from those coming in. It has to be asked from within and answered from within. And beginning from within, we quickly find that the word nation is, is too vague. It's only a first step into exploring the question. And that question splinters into a set of connected questions. Ah, yes, a nation is a society, yeah, that's a start. 
there are different kinds of societies. Are some societies overall better than others? Um, what, what would determine that? Uh, determine it for whom? Is there a set of criteria we can use to begin to answer these questions for, if not everybody, uh, at least the majority of people? Yeah, there's some guidelines that can be helpful. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the CARICOM Charter for Civil Society, among others. In the final analysis, though, the answer has to be a collective answer. Oh, it's not an answer. What I would like to throw into the mix, into the search for the answer, is that in trying to collectively answer these questions, a constant guide should be the idea of harmony with our natural environment. And a litmus test for that is that we should be able to experience the beauty of the landscape of a country. I'll come back to this later when I try to plot all these different strands of thought together. But for now, I want to engage with an urgent practical reason why the demand of beauty is so crucial for us. Two words, climate change. We don't need to go over all the grim statistics, all the, all the dire predictions. For the whole world, yes, but especially for small island states like St. Lucia. We know intellectually that if the present trends continue, our future holds greater heat, rising sea water, stronger hurricanes, drought, loss of plant species, loss of biodiversity in general, with all the, the ramifying environmental consequences that come with that. And all these changes in the, in the ecological realm refract into major changes in the social realm. Crime, including white collar crime, which is always more hidden. More fragmenting of the society into opposing social groups. And, and, and subcultures, more social deviance as common standards of behavior become more diffuse. Even the possibility of open, violent civil conflict. We don't need to go on. The twin giants of history always walk together. Change of landscape, change of socioscape. And with climate change, if the change of landscape is radical, so will be the change of socioscape. In all of this, where is the demand of beauty? How, how does it fit in? In an era of radical climate change, the demand of beauty must be radical as well. Preserving mangrove, refusing legally to allow its destruction in order to accommodate yet another hotel or factory shell. It's not only a matter of aesthetics, being picturesque and all that. It's an indispensable weapon in the battle of climate change. Not allowing buildings on the crest of hills is not simply a matter of maintaining the, the pristine beauty of the original hill range. It's to help hold the soil together in heavy rainfall to secure what is left of our watershed areas in this, this global situation of rapid climate change. The beauty of these original landscapes also constitute a bulwark for our survival. Let's take a regular example. The, the original landscape accompanying the flow of the cul-de-sac river in Bexon included the floodplain. It's on the old colonial maps, I think. Progress overrode the preservation of the floodplain. So now, in periods of heavy rainfall, the floors of houses and other buildings become the floodplain. Again, the original landscape would have been not only an expression of natural beauty, but it would have contained the temporary swelling of the river. As the manifestations of climate change become more drastic, the cost of violating this first principle in any proposed alteration of landscape may become too heavy to bear. And then what? Let's take another example. Huh? The issue of diminishing watershed area, which is problematic even in, in, in normal times, that can transmogrify into a societal nightmare as climate change infiltrates and invades the land. Food security, which, which comes down to the ability to feed ourselves from our own landscape, requires a reliable water supply. But as the watershed areas shrink through indiscriminate clearing for buildings and other purposes, the ability to provide water to grow food also shrinks. Water for drinking purposes also comes under threat. And yet water is the second absolute necessity for our bodies. Our physical survival requires first air and then water. It should remain constantly accessible to people, physically, financially. Let me insert a cautionary tale here, which is told to me and supported by more than one person. 
I had heard that St. Vincent is able to make greater use of gravity flow in its distribution of water, partly because of deliberate design of their distribution system, but partly also because fewer of its watershed areas have been destroyed. The pioneer conservationist Gabriel Coco Charles, I'm told, had consistently cautioned Sir John, the father of the nation, about not encroaching on watershed areas in the zeal for development. Sir John was a social visionary, there's no doubt about it, but also a man who, by temperament and experience, pursued the path he believed in against all obstacles. And it often gave wonderful results, but not always. The destruction of too many watershed areas in St. Lucia has meant that water distribution has had to rely heavily on the installation and the maintenance of pumps, more so than in St. Vincent. Again, the first principle. Wherever possible, work with nature, work with the mother. It's part of the demand of beauty, and we ignore or overrule that demand at our peril. Which brings us to the crucial question. Why is the demand so often ignored? or overruled. There's a sense in which I can argue that the whole disastrous phenomenon of climate change occurred partly because the demand of beauty was ignored, overruled for centuries. That ignoring and overruling began and it has continued because of an economic system. The stresses on the environment and, and the emaciation of community are direct consequences of this economic system. Poets have chronicled these consequences from the earliest onslaughts of that system in other countries. In mid-18th century England, as the Industrial Revolution was coming into being, the poet Oliver Goldsmith created a graphic word picture of the environmental and human costs and the class forces at work in his long poem, The Deserted Village. The man of wealth and pride takes up a space that many poor supplied. Space for his lake, his parks extended bounds, space for his horses, equipage, and hounds. The robe that, that wraps his limbs in, in silk and sloth has rubbed the neighboring fields of half the growth. These fenceless fields the sons of wealth divide, and even the bare one common is denied. Even now the devastation has begun and half the business of destruction done. Even now, methinks, as pondering here I stand, I see the rural virtues leave the land. Goldsmith focuses on, on, the, on the first phase of, of the process, where communities are evicted or otherwise pressured away from lands and homes that have been occupied by stable families and communities for generations. The mystic poet and, and painter William Blake brings his gaze to bear on the second phase of the process, when these uprooted people struggle to make a life in the horrendous conditions of lower class existence in London. I wander through each chartered street, near where the chartered Thameses flow, and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind-forged manacles I hear. In St. Lucia, as elsewhere in the Caribbean, the poets raged and sorrowed as the same system trampled on the ways of nature and the ways of community. Let's listen again to their words. This time, mourning the condition of their land, castigating those whom they see as responsible. There are images which recur in their work. Bulldozers, concrete buildings, especially hotels, asphalt, vanishing wildlife, dwindling and drying rivers, the sea. The voices are varied, and the emotional colors in the poems range from a lamenting blue to a withered brown to a raging red. And collectively, they create a word mural about the destructive wrestling match of progress and preservation in our country. Here's MacDonald Dixon. They come. The giant machines, threshing hearts from forest, slaying mud with iron claws, asphalt pours its salt into the open wound. Kendall Lippolit extends that motif. The dust from bulldozers years ago, clearing a bypass to the industrialized south, clogged the pores of plants and other things, 
And after the machines grumbled away, there was a stunned, shocked silence. George Goddard fills in the grim picture with distressing detail, physical and psychological. Tractors backfill wetlands to fulfill other dreams. Hours sleep late to wake to a nightmare that does not end. Mangroves falling, the high rising arrogance of condominiums. Machines keep on coming and time shares share none of our dreams. The construction of something called progress is, is relentless, it's spreading everywhere. Here's Kendall Liblet again in, in a minivan heading to a village in the south of the island. Along the way, road work gangs worked in the punishing heat and dust and noise and smell of progress towards whatever it was that progress was supposed to be leading us toward, not the village, which, as it grew larger, was diminishing. These various lines, uh, excerpts from poems, and most of what I'll quote will be excerpts, but Robert Lee has a poem from the early 1970s, which I want to present in its fullness. It's heartrending to realize that this poem is nearly 50 years old, yet it's so now. It's set in Barbados, yet it is so here. Skeets Bay Barbados. One always missed the turning, but found in time the broken sign that pointed crookedly, loath to allow another stranger here. Perhaps this Tom or Dick has plans for progress that will tow the boats away and make them quaint, that will tame this wild coast with pale rheumatics who tee off where sea eggshells and fishermen now lie with unconcern. Naked children and their sticks flush crabs from out their holes, and a bare-legged girl dressed in wet folds wades slow towards the a waning sun. The sea rose angrily. It knew that freedom here was short. It remembered other coasts, made mud by small-eyed men in big cars. And as before, it knew she'd vanish, the bare-legged girl. The children and the crabs would leave. A better world would banish them to imitation coconut trees. But those small eyes reflecting dollar signs have not yet found the crooked finger to this piece. And down the beach, the women bathe their sons, who will never talk like pap of fishing seasons past. Only memory will turn down this way when some old man somewhere recalls his day on this beach where sea eggshells once lay. Almost 50 years ago. But the poem could have been talking about less than three years ago, in 2019, just before Cabot, like Columbus, discovered Secret Beach and Donkey Beach and the Casabar in general. George Goddard indicates that the diminishing of original landscape goes together with a diminishing of culture. As a, a subtle inferiority complex sets in. Primeval bays forget their mother tongue and say, Marina. Until these ochre bays spawn yachts. And the horned sound of the sea trembling on the lips of Jean-Pierre Conlabi fades to a whimpering wind, wind rumpling the brown water sheet water tonguing the white feet of strangers. The mood in these, in these last pieces has been largely mournful, as though what's happened is beyond repair or reparation, as though all that's possible now is elegy. But that's only one reaction. In other poems, there's anger, an accusation. Listen to Travis Weeks. On the martyred mangrove, a white hotel stands, giving birth to millions from banker's womb. On the opening night, all investors shake hands, celebrating another great luxurious tomb. Listen to Dixon again, who, as a former banker, understands intricately the role that the financial system plays in this degradation. Go tell the old woman she must sell the one room wooden shack her mother left her, or break it down to make room for glass and wall. The banks are hungry for profit, 
and will lend any jock with collateral to build a mall. He sums up the situation in a, a pithy street vibes type of line. Um, a man named Progress spread his seeds all over the place. And Adrian Auger shows some of the results of this bitter seed. The ravine dwindled to a drain. The crayfish sipping gramoxon. The craggy streams of childhood billowing blue with diathene. Someone has built a, a concrete lay-by where Mashopes Pomdamo used to ripen summer holidays. And how does he describe this progress, which has cost us so much? What is the shape of it? Only repetitious highways. Hyphenating towns becoming cities by default. Forests pried open by the prow of roads. This, indeed, is a soulless anywhere, screaming iterations. Hurry home before all that was is gone, and we are forever changed. Derek Walcott's verbal brush strokes are large and masterful, and they almost complete this word mural of our situation now. These brush strokes have, as always of him, the, the sweep of history. I watch the doomed acres, where yet another luxury hotel will be built, with ordinary people fenced out. The new makers of our history profit without guilt, and are, in fact, prophets of a policy that will make the island a mall. And the breakers grin like waiters, like taxi drivers, these new plantations by the sea. A slavery without chains, with no blood spilt, just chain link fences and signs, the new degradations. I said Walcott almost completes the mural. Why almost? There's awareness of what is changing us. There's a deep anger. But in this mural, I have to look elsewhere than Walcott for the psychological resistance to all this. Here's Dixon again. I am not for sale. Not a single thought. Not a pour of sand. Not a gram of dirt. I am not for sale. Not a pinch of flesh. Not a yard of wood. I am not for sale. Not for sacks of gold. Not for a traitor's kiss. Psychological resistance. I hear those lines, uh, I'm not for sale, not for sacks of gold, or traitor's kiss. And I think of the recent efforts by a developer, that word is a misnomer here, trying to buy the goodwill of a country after ravaging its land and continuing that ravaging. The psychological resistance to that has to be strengthened. And if there is one burning reason why I grieve the absence of Calypso tense over the last two years is because the oral literature of the Calypso is a site of psychological resistance. Somebody needs to do that study, eh, by the way. I mean, that, that lecture, that, that book about, about how Calypso has helped us to question and, and, and criticize simplistic notions of progress over the years. But for now, I, I want to return briefly and finally to the poets to bring us to the deeper issue of why we got into this wrestling match between progress and preservation. Two poets express it with the, the concision that's possible only in poetry. George Goddard says, on this ancestral ground, Jalousy's tractors will not remove their shoes as Moses did. It's a deeply spiritual truth which goes to the heart of the matter. It's a blasphemous disrespect for nature and community. And Adrian Auger wraps up this truth in a cultural garb that we will recognize. Because we owe a debt, a loyalty to this landscape that sustain us, this, this earth that raised you, raised me, that should make us ask our ancestors if it is all right to cut down a tree that is older than we. Because somebody in navel string might be buried under there. What Goddard and Roger are pointing to is an attitude that's almost endemic among developers, in which the earth is seen basically as tons and hectares of inert material to be pushed and pulled and scraped and dug and drilled, with no other important consideration than how much money can be extracted from it, what margin of profit can accrue to the developer. When this attitude is so deeply ingrained as to block all other considerations, that is when the wrestling match begins. 
as to why the attitude is such a fundamental part of the mindset of the typical developer? It would take more than a lecture or even a series of lectures to delve into that understanding. The point is that that mindset gives rise to the scenarios that these poets witness against so eloquently. The poets who have been creating this world mural that we just looked at are not consciously politically ideological to the same degree. They may not even all call the system by the same name. But for me, the system has a name. It's capitalism. And it has a nature. Omnivoraciousness. And I'm not speaking here of the greed of individual persons, although that's one of the necessary factors to keep the system functioning. But even if an individual is not personally greedy for material things and not power hungry, a decent person, the system requires for its maintenance, for its very survival, a constant increase of goods and services, regardless of their social value. And if that relentless increase of goods and services, which is measured in money, uh, um, requires the involvement of decent, well-meaning people, they'll be absorbed into it, regardless of their good qualities. In fact, it will use their good qualities. If it requires cannibalizing the earth, eating the flesh and drinking the blood of our mother, then that is what will happen. It is what has happened for centuries. It is what will continue to happen until either the system is changed or this cosmic being, which is the earth, heals itself of the cancer, metastasizing through it, country by country. Now, understand me here. I know that capitalism is not an unmitigated evil. I know that there are benefits, technological, social, political, etc., that have come with it. But I do not believe that it is the only type of socioeconomic system which could have produced it, or which can produce these benefits. However, the real crux of the matter is that its very nature makes it incapable of solving the monumental problems that it has brought into being with these benefits. Capitalism cannot stop being what it is. It has had more than 400 years to help bring into being a society of justice and equal opportunity, satisfaction of the basic needs of food and shelter for all. And it has consistently not just failed, but actively worked against these being achieved. In our time, the material resources to achieve these are not an issue. The earth has the resources to not just support us, but to enable us to thrive if we live in a certain type of society. But capitalism did not come into being to create this type of society. And we, in the colonized world generally, and in the former slave societies especially, we know this. This is knowledge in our DNA from generations, centuries of bitter experience. Every step towards a more just and humane society has been a result of unremitting struggle, sometimes involving violence. That tells us all we need to know about whether we can realistically work together, work towards ecological and social harmony within this system. The demand of beauty, its invitation to harmony, therefore, is ultimately calling us to another kind of society. One which does not demand the, the disfigurement of landscape and socioscape, the destruction of natural beauty and community. Labels that we and others may use for this new society can be helpful if, if they push us to, to clarify what, what the features of that society should be. But finally, the labels are not that important. First thing I think is to recognize that this new society isn't all that new. It's been there in the interstices of the official main society all along, during slavery, during the immediate post-emancipation period, during the emergence of the modern Caribbean, and in this era of subtle economic and cultural imperialism. It's always been there. Some of its fundamental values and practices are a contradiction of classic Western capitalism. And although it has adapted, it has never vanished, it has never become extinct. One of its distinguishing features, so easily taken for granted, is the philosophy and practice of what in St. Lucia we call Kudme. Lately I've been reading the master's thesis of someone who gives me hope that I will see at least some fuller manifestation of this new society in my lifetime. The person is a political science student, a teacher, a social activist, and I wish she could have been here tonight. 
Raisa Joseph. And her thesis examines the principles and practice of Kudme in St. Lucia and in some of the Caribbean countries where it's known by a variety of names. She sees in it a model for a new type of governance, of government, and therefore a new type of society. One with a greater likelihood of harmony between ecology and, and social framework, between landscape and socioscape, something that we can truly call development. It's easy to romanticize this vision. It's also easy to wrongly label this vision as romanticism. At the heart of it is the urge for survival, not as an individual, but as a group, a community. What Raisa does with painstaking scholarship is to show how the spirit of Kudme was what enabled the formerly enslaved to create communities in post-emancipation St. Lucia and elsewhere in the Caribbean. Everything, I mean, building a house, clearing land, growing crops, meeting the expenses of burying the dead, starting a small business, everything depended on that spirit of Kudme being kept alive, practiced as a normal part of living. It had different forms, you know, friendly society, susu, beja, and different levels of complexity and structure and operations. Uh, it evolved into cooperatives, credit, credit unions, even banks. In fact, one of the fascinating areas in the thesis is the, the thumbnail sketch that she provides of the evolution of the, the library cooperative credit union and the first national bank, known in its infancy as the Penny Bank, they began as self-help organizations, arising from the need of ordinary people, farmers and fishermen and shopkeepers, to obtain loans when the colonial banking system would hardly let them through the door to even discuss a loan. Tracing the evolution from then to now, she shows how trust and a sense of community were absolutely essential elements in the Kudme spirit. And both implicitly and explicitly, she raises the issue of whether that spirit has been compromised in the growth of these now formidable institutions. And she raises it because the Kudme spirit is about modern economics, although that's a very overt expression of it. Tracing its historical lineage in St. Lucia all the way back to the Dopke of the Dahomey people, she shows that it functioned as well as it did because of a democratic mode of decision making and heartfelt collective action. And she shows too that in the classic manifestations of the Kudme, the indigenous arts and culture are always present. Group singing, music, food, drink are often a natural part of classic Kudme in action. There's a philosophy and principles of living at work there which go beyond and outlast just to get in the job done. You know, I had the glorious privilege once of being present when a community in Labon was, was planting cassava on a hill slope. Food was cooking on the Tuawash. Two men were beaten on lengths of bamboo and, and leading the call and answer song that the people were singing as they moved in lines along the hill slope and very precisely planting the cassava tubers. You'll understand that more than cassava was being planted that day. As I said, it's easy to romanticize all this, but it's also easy to wrongly label this as romanticism. Derek Walcott says in an essay, once we lose the tribal duty of help, the kudme, we lose spirit, then a country. Because if we're saying and believing that a vision of a Kudme society, no matter how complex the structure, is not realistic, is impossible. And what are we saying about the future of our society? If a society, Kudme in its governance as well as economic process, is not to be an option, then what are the options? Continue as we have done since adult suffrage with the Westminster model? not created by us and for us, and further debased by poisonous party politics. Continue with a centuries-old economic system of winners and losers in which, like elections, the winner takes all, and the de facto ideal is monopoly control. Is this the future that we pass on to our children and grandchildren? If so, then in that future, do not expect that they will see the beauty that we saw. 
they will be even more fenced and locked out of it. They will be met with more security guards and more guard houses. They will be met with more signs at boundaries of more places that are physically in St. Lucia, but in every other respect, are alien territory. I'm using the future tense only to indicate a more extreme version of what is already happening. In such a scenario, what are the possibilities for them to experience the demand of beauty? There have been times in the not so distant past when the experience of families and friends on VG Beach, it's a beauty that's been enjoyed for generations, was endangered. And that endangerment is encroaching on other areas. Donkey Beach, Secret Beach, Kazaba, Ostukap, Smuggler's Cove, Magritut, Los Depiton, insultingly renamed Sugar Beach, Oslivron. In the kind of apartheid tourism that's prevalent here, a lasso has been flung over the island. And as it tightens, the coastal areas where there are no settled communities are being not so subtly cordoned off from the population. And inland, in various development projects, the apartheid and alienation spreads over the body of the island. As the Kaizo writer Jati says, we lose in ground. The remedies and instruments for dealing with this are not far-fetched. They involve, among other things, an end to this insane practice of hotels always being built directly on beachfront, a comprehensive land zoning and use policy with a high priority on food security in this, this era of climate change, and actualizing, with most likely an upgrading, of the systems plan for protected areas in St. Lucia, which has been in existence since 2009. I wish I could see us getting to the stage that Bolivia has of instituting a law of Mother Earth, which in effect sees the Earth as a living being with rights, and which gives greater legal strength to a vision of sustainable development. However, even a, a die-hard non-politician like myself has some sense of the difficulties and the constraints in trying to bring even basic remedies like that um, you know, in, into a standard model capitalist society like ours, you know, straight jacketed in a, a Westminster model of governance. So, where does this leave us? It's a common experience that if you look at something or someone dear to you and realize it may be for the last time, then that something or someone becomes infinitely precious. And then you want to do whatever is possible to make this not be the last time. My task as poet and dramatist is to try to stir the realization in you that the next time you look at the waves on a particular beach or the sun going down behind a certain hill with no buildings blocking your vision, it could be the last time. Nearly 50 years ago, a Derek Walcott poem quietly demanded that I leave a room in order to experience more deeply in the open air the beauty that was being conjured in my imagination. Obeying that demand saved my life. That demand of beauty is still there. It is always here. Can be heard clearly enough that individually and collectively we do what we need to do to preserve not our individual lives, which must end, but preserve the possibility of creating communities that live more in harmony with our mother and therefore with each other and therefore at a higher order of being. Thank you. For I am looking for the, the MC or someone. Oh, sorry. I was giving you your much due time. <laughs> Can I get another round of applause for Kendall Lakula tonight? <laughs> this lecture was not just a lecture. It was a sermon. It was moving. It was powerful. It was insightful. 
informative, and beautiful. And we thank you for it. This evening, Kendall asks the question, to pursue progress or preservation. For this evening, I, with your permission, shall dub Kendall as this evening's hot gospeler, who sought to level, who sought not to level, but venerate all, including the church and sky. This journey of the parameters of beauty captures all possible facets of our beauty. I believe that this landscape is the essence of the St. Lucian people emanated into the physical realm. As within, so without. And herein, our inner and outer nature takes course. The significance of our recognition of beauty around us, whether physical, emotional, intellectual, is imperative to our present and future survival. Do we salt our beauty with the sands of time as we seek preservation? Or do we march intimately, hand in hand, rosy-eyed with a man named Progress? For generations, Sir Derek Kendall and other esteemed geniuses have masterfully done both through the expressions of their work. They knew, we know, or should know, that the beauty is us. We are inherently part of this omnipresent beauty around that where St. Lucia shows as clearly that what St. Lucia shows as clearly as Kendall has depicted. We create beauty along with our unique Caribbean St. Lucian culture, our way of life. Kendall eloquently shows us that our beauty is us, is our past, is our now, and what will we leave for our children? A people that does not embrace its environment, expressions, food, entertainment, and of course, the primary focus of this evening, its landscape, is perhaps a people lost. This evening, I would like you to thank Kendall again for enriching us with the many local vibrant examples for us to make a concerted effort to demand that we embrace ourselves and we de embrace our demand for beauty. Put your hands together once more. Now, after that powerful delivery by Kendall, we shall have a brief discussion about the lecture. So, we shall be taking some questions from the audience in a typical question and answer type fashion. If you have a question, raise your hand, I will call on you. You ask your question, point it to Mr. Kendall, and I will moderate this session. Um, to begin, Oh, there, if, sorry, if you have a question, you go to the mic. There's a mic pointed on either end of the crowd, to my left and my right, and on to the center section as well. So let us begin this brief session. What are the questions or perhaps concerns you may have for Kendall's delivery this evening? Who would like to come up first? Kendall had spoken a little bit about preserving our history, and he, he asked the question. There's a question in the corner? Go ahead. I'm so moved. <laughs> I gotta say something. Lower your mask, please. Yeah. So. The name is Laura Jomo Jopier. Speak into the, the mic, we're not hearing you. Yeah, the name is Jomo. Thank you, Jomo. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Well, Kendall was my teacher at St. Mary's College, and he taught me literature. He, in, he, <laughs> he introduced me to fuckery with the world with all his worthless and senseless ambitions. Remember that? <laughs> and tonight has been a treat. So my teacher, everything is new now for me after your lecture. My mind is new. The moon is new. The sun is new tonight after your lecture. The whole world looks rinsed in water. 
washed in the rain. I leap and dance tonight in my soul. Inside me energy that creates and sustains the universe or the island. I really, really, really like, I, I was, you know, moved. You know, my teacher, you put a lotion on my eyes tonight that dissolve all the cataracts. <laughs> and now everywhere I look, I see beauty. Merci and shy. Merci and shy. Merci and shy. Thank you. Thank you. A man who needs no introduction. Good evening, everybody. Um, I don't want to interfere with the, the theme, the messages, the lessons uh, from Kendall. Fantastic. I appreciate it, Kendall. Blessings. OK. Um, <laughs> I want to hail Kendall. I want to keep hail Kendall. What we, what we experienced here tonight came from a long, 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 long way back. Um, what we experienced with Kendall about ourselves, experience with it. Um, there was something uh, underneath Kendall. I've been following Kendall's poetry from, he's, I have told him that, he's my favorite St. Lucian um, writer, I think. Technically, he's just amazing. He's just amazing, technically, as a writer. And from his lecture, too, you could see his, his eye, his eye for observing and getting out and writing and putting it into words. Kenel, I want to pray for strength for you and art in St. Lucia that it continues that it continues, because it is so, so, so important. Behind the lessons and all of this, um, in the middle of all what you were doing was pointed us to the importance of our artists in this development and preservation, the importance of our artists on the vanguard of it. And so I want to pray for strength for you and for our artists. There are a few little lines on you, quoted lines from so many poets as well, so on. I felt a little left out, so I'm going to put my lines <laughs> in there, in, in, in your thing tonight. Um, you know, look at social scape and landscape and bringing it together. I want to pray that your works of art and our works of art keep flowing and flowing like the broad river, which never goes, except it dries, and the land is thirsty, and a scar runs across the people. Thank you, Kendall. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I I'm proud to call myself a St. Lucian citizen for the past 30 years. I'm 48. <laughs> because I came here at 18, and the very, I came here the year Sarata passed, and the very next year was when Sir Derek Walker won the Nobel Prize for Literature. And as an 18 year old, I promised myself that um, this guy whose work I studied back in Ghana, I'd want to at least understand his work and probably right. And then about five years later was when I first met Kendall Hippolyte. He's been my mentor since. Kendall started his lecture by saying Derek Walker saved his life. For the past 15 or so years, I've been making a living through words, writing them and so on. Thanks to this gentleman right in front of here and thanks to Derek Walker. Kendall has been a mentor for me for the past 22 years, 24 years. And when I came here tonight, I said, listen, for all the good advice you've been giving us all these years, I never really looked forward to a lecture from you. 
the, the advice was good enough. But um, he's always been the, the, the kind of person, you know, I'd write a poem now or a short story and I'd shoot it to him. And I know he's a very busy man, but before the day is out, he'll shoot back a message and say, well, listen, I like paragraphs one, two, three. How about if you start the entire thing with paragraphs four? He's a consummate professional. He pushes you to the limit. I remember in 2005, we were preparing for the NCF Telethon, a group of poets, and we were in Central Library. And every, all the other poets are there, and he's grilling us. And he asked me to perform a poem. And I, he's by the door, scratching his head, and I'm trying to rehearse the poem. And when I'm finished, he takes a long pause, about 10 seconds, and then he lifts his head. He goes like, you finished? I'm like, yeah. He's like, how do you think you do? I'm like, I think I did well. He's like, I don't think you did. I'm like, all right, good. And you want me to do it again? He's like, you want to raise their time on mine? Go ahead. It's up to you. And he goes back into that posture again. And then I reach down deep inside and I recited that poem again. And he came up to me and he goes like, um, how do you think you did? I said, well, I think I did better. He's like, I think so too. And he goes like, by the way, Stan, who wrote that poem? I said, me. He's like, you? That? You wrote that? I'm like, yeah. He's like, nah. I'm like, yeah, I wrote it. He's like, but if you wrote that, you're the best person to sell your poem. I never forgot that lesson because a lot of poets might have looked at this gentleman and said, well, listen, he's being arrogant and he's all of this. But he taught me he's the best teacher to me in, in terms of being humble. Yeah, he brings out the best in you. So tonight, your lecture, Kendall, how do you think you did? <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Um, I want to start off by, of course, expressing appreciation for such a masterful presentation. My, as you probably would know, background is political science and political philosophy. And what you delivered tonight was a critique of capitalism as an economic and a social system, for me, as a student of, of government and political science. And of course, there was the literature, it was located in the literature and the poems, but it was really a critique of capitalism in many, many, many ways. But more than that, it was a masterful, mature critique of capitalism. And I'll tell you why. Because very often you would see in persons of artistic orientation and extremism. And you were able to examine between preservation and progress and a balanced understanding of the necessity of both and why we must find a way out to ensure the survival of ourselves as a people, as a society, in our developmental first. And at one point, I was wondering whether you were going to go to the romantic side and, and, and say, preserve everything. <laughs> but you didn't do that. But surely you would not go the other direction, which is let progress you know, go unrivaled, because that's capitalism in its essence. So I have a couple of questions for you. Because you know, capitalism, by its very nature, is avaricious. It wants to consume everything. And you, out, you outlined that. You said so. But capitalism has also taken the institutions and served for its own purpose. So we saw the growth of trade unions, political parties, that really killed the revolutionary spirit of the rebelling people huh? in the 1930s. And then you mentioned Kudme, you know, the Susu, the credit union. They've now become agencies of capitalism. So, but I hear you almost saying, that's what we need. But for me, capitalism has already Thanks. taken over those institutions and made them servants of capital. Mm -hmm. But we can't go back there mm -hmm. because it's a dialectical motion. You know, it's the evolution that takes place. And capitalism is exactly that. It has its own contradictions, yeah? But can we go back to those institutions that are now serving capital? Mm -hmm. <coughs> so I, I am thinking right. in moving forward, what is the synthesis? Mm -hmm. Because you've had the thesis, the antithesis. What is this synthesis now? Mm. Where it is that we're going to go 
to ensure we get a balance between preservation and progress. Mm -hmm. Because that, that's where we want to go. You spoke about the higher embodiment of our existence. So I, I need to, to hear your yeah. thoughts on that. Where do we go in terms of the characteristics of this new order that we all aspire to? Yeah. Um, so I'm speaking off the top of my head for the time being. And, and like I said, somewhere in this, the answer to this is always a collective answer. Otherwise, it's not an answer. But um, you, you say that capitalism has taken over the, the institutions. And I think to some extent that's true. But taking over an institution is not the same thing as taking over the spirit that brought the institution into, into being. And the spirit, the, the, the vibe, like, I, I, that, that's a loose way of putting it, the spirit, the particular kind of thirst for a certain type of life, for a certain type of community, the spirit of that, um, if it's no longer in those institutions, that doesn't mean that that spirit is not there. Now, how to find the, the shapes, the other types of institutions that have to be created? And institutions sound like such a, such a grand word. I, I, I don't even want to go there because I, I don't want to go there. But I'm a, little, I'm a little shy of talking about creating institutions and we start to imagine, you know, like the trade union is an institution. But everything starts, honestly, with, with, with individuals and the desire for, hmm, use a loose word, the desire for, for better, the desire to, to change, to do away with what's, what, 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 what is pressing us down. And I'm thinking back to, say, if, 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 you, put, if you put yourself, say, in you know, late, 90, uh, late, late um, 18th century, um, going into, in, in, into the middle of the night, into the early 19th century, you know, like in the heyday of slavery and so on. And I'm trying to imagine our ancestors there and trying to figure out how do we break this? How do we change this? They don't necessarily at the time have to know what the shape of what they're going to will be. They don't necessarily have to have the institutions thought out through. The main thing that they need to know, and not miss me there, was that this has to end one way or another. And it's not just that we end it and then we will see. But I think when that is when when, when that desire is burning enough, is strong enough, then the question of um, the, 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 the question of what is the shape of this new thing that we're going to do? Honestly, I think it becomes secondary. So I, I don't want to sound like I'm dodging your question. But for me, the fact that, and Raisi herself says it too, I mean, she, she does say, has the Library Cooperative Credit Union, um, you know, is, is it still an example of Code Mayor? Is the, the, the First National Bank, is it still an example of Code Mayor? Um, if it isn't, then where is that spirit of Code Mayor? Because in her understanding and in mine too, it's not dead, it cannot die. And therefore, where and how it's going to surface again, to be honest, I don't know. I, I don't want to sound like I'm dodging. How this capitalist system is going to break for me, I, I believe for years now that the, the wedge, the, the, the weak points in it, and the wedge that can, that can break it is a concern with the environment. I think, I think if we set ourselves to and, and um, what choice do we have but to set ourselves to, to live within the principles of nature? If, if we don't do that, we, we, what are we literally, physically, mortally, actually doomed? Um, and, and to me, I, I think it, it, the, the, there's, a, there's a need for that to become so real for us that people can refuse to continue you know, adding to their doom. I, I, I wish I could be more specific than that. I can't. I really can't. But I don't think the first concern is, all right, capitalism has taken over these institutions. What kind of institutions are we going to set up? I don't think the first concern has to be, what kind of institutions are we going to set up? I think the first concern is, break this thing down. It, it's, you know, break it down. Because it, it can't work. It's doomed. It's... It's a matter of time. I mean, you know, the, the, the most impartial science is saying that it's a matter of 
Time. It's a matter of time before this planet Earth, its, its actual systems, its actual ecological systems, literally break down. And if shares, you know, the quest for shared physical survival to see your children grow and your grandchildren grow, if that can motivate us to say, break it down, we're going to figure out the next thing, then we, we really are doomed. But I, but I think it's, I think that desire is strong enough. I don't know. I don't know. And that's why I want to keep telling myself, and I see it on Facebook all the time, the impossible is impossible until it happens. You know, everything that looks as though, boy, I see how that's going to happen. You know, it's, it's, so, you know, it's been so many, so many examples in the past. Things that people never believed would happen, they see it, you know? So that's my hope. That's my faith. Yeah. You know. It is now 9.41. Yes, we will take one more question or contribution. Honestly, I just wanted to thank you for actually um, fully expressing the voice of people, especially young people like me, who are actually having conversations about putting money together just to get a loan to own a piece of the land that we have, you know, that says, I, people say that I'm a solution, but I cannot even afford with my minimum wage job to own any piece of this island. So thank you, honestly. Thank you for fully voicing what at times seems like, like a rage that I have. When I look out and I see all the development that I do not have access to. Thank you. Thank you. I can't keep silent about it, so I just had to come and talk about it. I met Des, the late Desmond Tutu in South Africa as a student, and we were having a seminar, and I asked him, Dr. Toots, and I'm, I'm addressing Brother Hiller's um, um, quest about the synthesis of the whole thing. And I, I said, did you all sacrifice um, justice on the altar of peace? Because at at um, Steve Biko's funeral, he said, you cannot be reconciled with your dog. You have to recognize, there must be reasoning, and if people you recognize, when there's reasoning, and people are on the same page, and so forth. So I asked him the question, and he looked at me, and he said, young man, what's the alternative? And that is what Kendall is trying to say here. What is the alternative? The road we gone there is doomed. That's where it's going. That is where we dare already climate change and all of that. So what's the alternative? We have to try something new because that thing ain't working. What we have there ain't working. It ain't working for the youth. That is why they're killing one another and all of that that is going on there. That is part of it, you know. That is part of the, you know, the breakdown of the whole society we're going on now. I go to the ghetto and fellas tell me, boy, you're Makume, man, you know what's going on? You know, it's, it's a war. We can't eat. You know, we go to school, we get degrees, more degrees than thermometers, and we can't get a job. We can't survive, as the young lady said, you can't buy a piece of land. And the foreigners come in and they're just giving them money to buy it. Why? You're Makume or what, Jomo? What, what's in you on? No, this is real talk about the fellas in the ghettos, you know. So we have to change, we have to find a way. Use our creativity and our imagination to find a way. And it wouldn't be a perfect solution. Nobody has all the solutions, but we have to try something new. It ain't working. Like South Africa, they, it wasn't working. So they had to try something new. It ain't finished yet. La lucha continua, but we got to do something. And, 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 and all of us have to come together to make it happen. I think that is, that is part of the solution. Thank you for your contribution. Before we close, I would like to make two special announcements. The pictures that you have seen this evening that have been on display this evening are for sale and were painted by Derek Walcott's son, Peter Walcott. So if you'd like to purchase, you can speak with the 
both. Oh, three pictures. Two. These two. Okay, these, yes, these two. So if you'd like to purchase this, you can speak with the CDF or the Nobel Laureate Festival Committee um, about your interest. Also, Kendall has prepared a bit of a display for you to go home with where out on this banana leaf, he has placed some pieces that you can observe. And if you'd like, you can take one with you to go home with this evening. So feel free to <laughs> review. <laughs> Let us, um, in our haste, let us please try to ensure that we observe the social distancing protocols. <laughs> yes. I, um, I, I just want to clarify, I, I didn't put it together. Um, this is an art installation from uh, my, my art and heart friend, um, Finola Jennings-Clark, um, supported by and helped by Sam Jobo there, which brings together which, you know, um, our ecology, our history, our heritage um, and shows our situation. Shows when you know, if you get a chance to come closer to it, find there's, there's money in this, well, not really money. <laughs> there's, 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 there's natural things, hopefully, when I was thinking. So, th th things from our heritage, particularly from our, oops, thanks, from our Amerindian heritage and coming on. So, um, and I feel I'm very taken by the young lady's thing about. Yeah, you 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 you're raised here and, and you're working hard and you 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 can't you can't own a, a piece of the can't own a piece of this. What what we're hoping, what I'm hoping, what Finola and I and, and, and Joe are hoping, is that out on this front bit here with the um where the, the, the banana strip is, these are bits of St. Lucia. These um in, in this installation there's sand from the Atlantic coast, from the Caribbean coast. Um, there's ruku that, that the, um, that the Amerindians use. Um, <clears throat> there's cotton, which is grown there. Um, number, number of different things, shells, bits of rock, and so on. Bits of our heritage and the ecology. Um, what's out on the strip here? Feel free to claim it. Take it home with you. Let it remind you of <laughs> Well, you choose what you want to take on to try to make the difference. But if something from here that you pick up can remind you and help you to keep faith, to hold on to a resolve, to do something, then by all means feel free. Um, it's wide open. So thank you so much. I really, this is it's a lovely vibe with everyone here. So I really appreciate the presence of the Prime Minister and the Minister of Tourism. It's very, very rare for an occasion like this or, yeah, or any occasion involving the arts and so on to find ministers of government. So I'm deeply appreciative. Give thanks. Earlier, Kendall, you mentioned that you had a very generous audience tonight and you are a generous artist. So the CDF and the Nobel Laureate Festival Committee would like to show our gratitude to you and present to you a token of our appreciation. This token would be presented by Ms. Strenia Frederick. Um, Kendall, for me, is also a mentor in the arts. I started doing directing when I was 18 years old at the Lighthouse Theatre. And he was the first person who believed in me and gave me an opportunity to direct a production as a young person then at 18. And that was my first sort of introduction. And um, I remember sitting and blocking the play with him. And from that moment, my entire life changed. I'm still doing directing today and doing a production with six actors and leaving Lighthouse at one o'clock in the morning and the main gate is locked and scaling over it <laughs> to walk home and there's no bus, no route ban and walking the first person who lives the furthest home and of course, you know, I lived in town at San Susi, so I go home last alone. So for me, that grounded me in an experience of community and being supported to others and helping. So thank you, Kendall. Um, I can't believe I'm crying in front of everybody. <laughs> so 
the Nobel Laureate Festival Committee, St. Lucia, expresses its sincere appreciation to Kendall Hippolyte for presenting the 2022 Sir Derek Walcott Memorial Lecture, Castries, to date, 18th January, 2020. Thank you, Kendall. Thank you again, Ms. Frederick. As we conclude, I know we are very well close to curfew. I would like to give, <laughs> like to give some special acknowledgments as we um, peruse the art display onto the left, and as you make your way out, I'd like to say a special thank you to the chairperson, Dame Paulette Louisi, and the Nobel Laureate Festival community. <laughs> Sigrid Nama and the family of the Derek and the family of Sir Derek Walcott, Honorable Dr. Ernest Hilaire, Minister of Culture and Creative Industries, Minister of Tourism, Culture and the Creative Industries, Kendall Hippolyte, not the National Television Network, All Biz Media Limited, Audio Works in Lucia, Zenith Williams Designs, the Library Credit Union the Finance Administrative Center for Facilitating Us So Late, Events Company of St. Lucia, St. Lucia Tourism Authority, and the staff of the Cultural Development Foundation. I would also like to give a thank you to our sponsors, the Government of St. Lucia, the Office of the Governor General, Ministry of Tourism, Investment, Creative Industries, Culture, and Information, the Ministry of Finance, Economic Development, and Youth Empowerment, Library Credit Union, Bank of St. Lucia, and last but not least, the St. Lucia Electricity Services Limited, otherwise known as Lucilec. I would like to thank everybody again for coming here today to this tradition that we have started since 1997 and without fail have not missed a year, even during under the pandemic times. Thank you again. Drive safe. Get home safely. Oh, I was also told that there are some small refreshments. Take away refreshments.